In order to be able to purify and separate a mixture of proteins, we have to know a certain property about the proteins that differs between the different proteins that we want to actually separate. So one common type of property that we use is the size of the proteins and that's because inside our body we have a great diversity of proteins and they vary in size. For example, we have very tiny proteins such as insulin which is only 51 amino acids in length. But we also have very, very large proteins such as titan, also known as connectin, which is over 27,000 amino acids in length. So we have these proteins that vary in size and we can use this property of size to basically separate and purify mixture of proteins. And one technique that we developed over the years to help us purify mixture of proteins based on size is gel filtration chromatography, also known as molecular exclusion chromatography. So let's begin by taking a look at the setup. The setup is relatively simple. We have this funnel and we place the funnel on top of this long column. And inside the column, we have these gel beads. Now, what's so special about these spherical gel beads? Well, these gel beads consist of a hydrated polymer, such as, for example, dextrin, which is a carbohydrate. And even though this molecule, this bead, is insoluble, it doesn't dissolve in aqueous solutions, it contains these tiny holes, these tiny pores, and that allows small molecules to pass through those tiny pores. So, this is our setup. We have the funnel inside. Uh, um, the, the, the funnel is placed on top of our column and inside the column we have these porous gel beads. And so as our fluid flows along our gel beads, that water doesn't actually dissolve our beads. So those beads are insoluble, but things can actually pass across those beads as a result of those tiny pores. So let's actually zoom in onto the molecular level and see what's taking place on the molecular level as we pour our mixture of proteins. So let's take a look at the following diagram. Let's suppose we have a mixture of three different proteins. So we pour the proteins into our funnel and it travels into this column section that contains our beads. What exactly will happen? Well, let's suppose we have three proteins of varying sizes. So we have a small green protein, we have an intermediate size red protein, and we have a large protein. Now, those tiny proteins, because of their small size, they will be able to fit into the internal structure of these beads. And so what that means is these tiny green proteins will be able to fit into the crevices, the pores inside our bead, and they will spend more time traveling inside our bead. These red intermediate proteins, because of their slightly larger size, sometimes they will be able to fit into the pores, but sometimes they will not. And as a result, because they spend less time moving inside the crevices of our beads, they will travel quicker along our column as compared to these tiny proteins. And if we examine this very large protein shown in purple, these proteins will not be able to fit into the tiny pores, into the internal structure, the volume of those beads, and so they will never travel inside the bead and always move around the bead, and as a result, they will emerge first at the bottom of that column. Now, one analogy that I can give is, let's suppose we have a patch of grass and we have a race between an ant and a beetle. So an ant is a very tiny insect and because of its very small size, it will have to take all the different pathways inside that grass. So it cannot take any shortcuts because of its very small size, but because of the size of the beetle, because the beetle simply cannot fit through the different tiny pathways where the ant can fit, that beetle will make its way first to the end of that grass, uh, the patch of grass, because of its larger size. And in the same analogous way, these larger proteins, because they can't fit uh, in the tiny pores, they can take all those different pathways that our small protein can, these large proteins will make their way to the end, to the bottom of that column first.
So once again, as a mixture of proteins travels through our column, the small proteins into the porous beads, but the larger proteins cannot fit into the internal volume of those beads. And as a result, those large proteins will end up at the bottom first, while the small proteins will emerge last. So let's see how we can actually carry out this experiment with these three different proteins by using gel filtration chromatography. So let's take a look at the following three diagrams. So let's begin with diagram one. In diagram one, we have the beaker. Inside that beaker, we have our solution, the mixture of three different proteins. So we have the small green protein, intermediate red protein, and the large purple protein. So we pour it into the funnel, and the funnel essentially exits through this tiny little hole and ends up in the column. So what happens is when we move on to step two, in step two, at the top of our column, we have this collection, the mixture of three different types of proteins. So initially they have not yet separated because they have not yet traveled through the section of our column, through the beads. Now, as we begin to wait, what happens is these proteins begin to travel. They are pulled by the force of gravity. So as they travel, those tiny proteins, the green proteins, will, traverse, will, will travel slowest because they have to travel through the tiny pores of those, of those beads. While the red proteins will travel slightly quicker because sometimes they get stuck inside the beads and have to travel through the beads, but other times they make their way around the beads. And so they will be found somewhere in the middle as compared to the green, which will be found at the top. Now, these large proteins essentially never make their way into those beads because they simply cannot fit into the internal volume of those beads. And so what happens is they will emerge first. They will be found at the bottom relative to these two other proteins. So we have the protein, this protein number one, we have this protein number two, and we have here this protein number three. And so in the final step, what we can actually do is we can take three test tubes and as we see this protein reaching the bottom, we can essentially open up this, uh, open up this knob or turn the knob and this basically, uh, this protein enters our test tube number one. And then we can wait for this to get to the bottom. We open up our, we open up our knob and so it enters test tube number two. And then when this reaches the bottom, and once again, we turn the knob, open up this hole, and so this will elute into this test tube number three. And so now we have these three different separate test tubes that contain those isolated proteins, protein number one, protein number two, and protein number three. Now, I should emphasize that gel filtration chromatography only works if there is a relatively large difference in size between our proteins. If we use three proteins that are of the same size, this is not a very useful technique because these proteins will basically have the same exact rate of movement down our beads, and so we will not be able to separate them with this way with this method. So we only use gel filtration chromatography if we know that there is a large size difference between the proteins in the mixture that we actually want to separate.